evening. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. That's at Ben Kalos on social media. Tonight we're expecting nearly 500 people on this Zoom. I imagine many of you are part of the 142,000 people who have emailed me uh, over the past three weeks to defund the NYPD. Uh, for those of you who are new or outside my district, welcome and glad to have you. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. I represent 168,000 people on the Upper East Side, East Harlem, East Midtown to Roosevelt Island. And again, I wanna thank everyone for uh, joining us and we'll get right to business. Uh, today's town hall will go until 7 p.m. Many of the questions we will answer were asked in similar forms by several attendees. I believe we received uh, about 30 to 40 uh, questions all relating to defund NYPD. And for the sake of times, questions that have been submitted beforehand have all been read and abridged into selection of key questions for each topic. Our featured guest tonight is the New York City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson. Since he was elected Speaker in 2018, Speaker Johnson has moved quickly to enact ambitious reforms for our city. The results have been impressive. We have worked together on some of those victories over the past three years. And I'm proud of the record that we've accomplished together. Together, we passed campaign finance reform, which took big money out of New York City politics by increasing the city's campaign matching system to a full public match. And so what that means is people can run for mayor or any office on small dollars. It means folks can say no to real estate money, which is something that I've been pushing for since before I was elected and as a, even as a candidate. And I'm really hoping it will completely change what the next city council looks like after 2021 and what the next mayoralty looks like after 2021. When it comes to public health, I don't think there's anyone who can hold a candle to Speaker Johnson. He's the previous health committee chair. And together we've passed healthy, happy meals legislation, which is meant to combat this city's uh, obesity epidemic in that more than half of New Yorkers are overweight and one in five children is coming into kindergarten overweight. Healthy, happy meals is very simple. It just says that we should include a healthy beverage as the default option on menus. And I will tell you that McDonald's is already doing it and it has changed Happy Meals for more than half of the meals served across this nation and across this planet. Uh, before the coronavirus, uh, we had a Legionnaires cluster on the Upper East Side. We also saw an outbreak in the Bronx. And uh, when we passed a legislative package, we discovered rampant noncompliance working with WNYC. And Speaker Corey Johnson and I worked together on legislation that I authored that requires electronic registration with the city so we can hold every building in the city accountable and make sure that we keep those cooling towers safe. We've also passed legislation to improve school bus transportation for our city's children by installing real-time GPS trackers on school buses. Uh, I, I'm sure the speaker will tell you how disappointed he gets in the mayor and this administration at times, and they did not get their assignment done for this school year but they better be on track for getting it done this September. I don't wanna hear another horror story of a parent who can't find their child, doesn't know where they are, especially during a uh, snowstorm. And speaking of school seats, uh, we've been fighting for more school seats on the east side. We don't have enough. And thanks to legislation that I was able to author and with again, Speaker Johnson's support, we were able to pass a law to make sure that DOE told us how they can't school seats and we ended up getting an additional 200 school seats for the neighborhood for a total of 800 seats. So that's just a little bit of one of the things that Corey has been able to do for this district, for children in our city. And he's also not afraid to take on tough issues. Climate change shouldn't be a tough issue, but uh, Speaker Johnson and I know that uh, there is a climate emergency and that's why New York City is the biggest city in the world to declare a climate emergency. And uh, when the coronavirus began to spread, uh, but had not really hit New York City hard, Speaker Johnson was the first leaders to speak up clearly about the imminent risk of the virus and the need to take decisive action. It was after meeting with Speaker Johnson, who had been consulting international health experts, that we actually closed our office uh, on March 13th. I think we were one of the first offices to do so. Uh, and uh, we've been remote ever since. 
Uh, I actually came into my office. It's currently completely empty. Uh, and that's just because I've been working at home with my daughter. That's been the new normal. Uh, unfortunately, she is very, well, fortunately, she's very happy. But when she's happy, it's high pitched. And so some folks who might be listening on earphones were not enjoying that as much. Uh, Speaker Johnson has helped lead the council on important police reforms. Uh, and we'll get into some of what we've been able to do just today, uh, as well as some big position posi statements he's taken uh, with regards to defund NYPD. I'd like to remind everyone that we've received uh, close to 300 questions for this meeting tonight. We're going to do our best to get through a lot of them. Uh, and uh, first we will hear from uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, Corey, welcome, glad to have you here. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> I know there are a lot of questions, so I'm not gonna speak for long and there's a lot to highlight on uh, New York reopening, but also on uh, the conversation around policing, on defunding the NYPD. And so I know you have some questions for me on that. Uh, so instead of giving my uh, typical opening statement, I want to allow time to answer as many of these questions as possible. I just want to say thank you, Ben, for convening tonight. And I'm happy to take as many questions as we can. I'll speak just for a moment on uh, the, the defund movement and where we are as a council. So folks know, because I think that rightfully should be a big focus of what we're talking about tonight. So to me, defunding the NYPD means divesting from the NYPD and investing in communities, communities of color, low income communities, communities that have had a disproportionate uh, impact on them from COVID-19 and that have suffered from decades and generations and centuries of structural racism. Uh, and so what we are pushing for in the budget is the council has identified $1.1 billion in uh, budget cuts, reallocation, savings in the NYPD. I'm happy to speak about what some of those things are specifically, but I just want to highlight for a moment that one of the things that I have been trying to do over these last many weeks since George Floyd was murdered is uh, really work with our black colleagues in the council, really listen to our black colleagues in the council uh, and make sure that we are not getting out ahead of them, but really hearing them and making sure that we're moving with them and led by them. So the statement that the council put out last Friday that outlined that $1.1 billion in uh, targeted and identified cuts to the NYPD was signed on by the co-chairs of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus Council members, Adrian Adams and Danique Miller, our majority leader, Lori Cumbo, uh, the chair of our public safety committee, Donovan Richards, uh, the chair of our finance committee, Danny Drum, and the chair of our capital budget subcommittee, Vanessa Gibson. And so we are working hard on this. I will say, as I said at the stated meeting today, where we voted on a package of uh, legislation on chokeholds, on badge coverings, on all these things. We know that those things are not transformative. Those things are necessary things to do, but they are not what is going to fundamentally alter and change and re-envision what policing looks like in New York City, what public safety means in New York City. And I believe that this moment is a reckoning. It is a reckoning for America, it's a reckoning for our city, and it's especially a reckoning for white people. And part of what I have tried to do over these last few weeks is to take responsibility and apologize where I've been wrong. Apologizing for voting for a budget in 2015 that authorized 1,300 new cops and not making excuses for it, normalizing that it is okay to apologize uh, and to say we did not do things correctly and we need to do things better. So I am committed and I believe there's a majority of the council that is committed to getting that money out of the NYPD and into communities of color, into communities that have suffered. I will just say that the administration, the mayor's office, they have not been open to this. They have been extraordinarily resistant. They have said no at every uh, turn so far. And so, uh, you know, I believe we will marshal the votes in the council, but it is a matter of us uh, not buckling uh, 
uh, to the mayor, which I believe we won't, but we can't uh, do this unilaterally. Uh, so we are gonna keep fighting, we are gonna keep pushing, we are gonna keep identifying other areas where we could save money. And, and I just wanna be very clear uh, for folks that may not follow the exact nitty gritty of the city council's budget process. Every year the council funds about $600 million in funding for initiatives, for programs, for discretionary items. That funding goes to human services and social services, to local schools, to senior centers, to cure violence programs, to many of the nonprofits that have been leading the charge on criminal justice reform and in this defund movement. And part of the games that the administration is playing is they want us to trade that funding that we fund every single year to these community-based organizations for them agreeing to more of a cut for the NYPD. We are not gonna do that. We are not gonna engage in that game where we are putting senior centers and schools and youth programming on the chopping block as a trade. The budget will not be balanced on the back of communities that have suffered too much during the last three months, but even before that. So I am committed as speaker and working with my uh, black colleagues and all the members of the Black, Latino and Asian Caucus over the next two weeks to land this budget in a way that works for communities, that sees a significant cut to the NYPD's budget, that moves police out of school, that moves police out of dealing with homeless people, that moves police dealing with mentally ill people. I am committed to that. And I believe a majority of the city council is committed to that. The de Blasio administration is not committed to that at this moment. And so we are fighting with them every single day to try to get them on board with the demands of New Yorkers and with the demands of the city council. Thank you, Corey. There are a lot of politicians out there who, who, who kind of equivocate and, and say some things, but I guess the, the big question is, will you commit to saying defund NYPD and that you're committed to defunding NYPD? Repeat that again, Ben, I apologize. Are you committed to saying the words defund NYPD and doing so with your actions? Yes, I mean, I'm saying that right now. To me, defunding the NYPD means removing money from them and investing that into low-income communities, communities of color, communities that have been over-policed, reinvesting in communities and divesting from law enforcement and taking away some of the areas that they have been involved in. Uh, again, a short list of that is schools, mental health, homelessness. We could also talk about crossing guards. We could talk about uh, traffic enforcement. We could talk about a host of things that has come under the NYPD umbrella over the years. And in this moment of reckoning, it is now time for us to take big, bold, transformative action to re-envision and reimagine what public safety actually looks like and what it means. You could move um, you know, school safety into a new agency called the community, uh, an agency for uh, community safety, and you could have crossing guards in there. You could have uh, people that are in schools in there. Uh, when we talk about people that are homeless or people who are suf suffering from an untreated mental health issue, we should be using social workers and mental health professionals, uh, not police officers. And uh, we are committed to doing that in this budget. Uh, again, I'm happy to get into the real nitty gritty if people want me to on the budget process and how it works under our city charter. Uh, but um, it would make things a lot easier uh, and a little more ironclad if the mayor was willing to play ball with us on a serious way. Under the city charter, the mayor has an enormous amount of power budget-wise. That doesn't mean that we uh, can't do things as a council and we are uh, exploring that and we are committing to push the envelope as far as we can. Uh, so we are gonna do that as a body. Uh, we are not going to uh, abide by some tinkering around the edges. This is a moment to do something significant and real and meaningful. And I believe a majority of the city council members believe in doing that. And I think we can get 
not just a majority of the council there. I think we can get a super majority of the council members there. I believe uh, we can get 34 votes there. It's going to take conversations and hard work, but I feel confident about that. I just want to say as co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, uh, which is a near majority of the council. We, st we put out a statement in solidarity with you, with the Black, Latino, and Asian caucus, uh, with our leaders of color. And uh, I, I, for one, am firmly committed to defund NYPD. Uh, and so I think one fo thing folks are very feel very uh, passionately about is $1 billion this fiscal year. Yes. Uh, and, so I, and so you're committed to that if you can share just some, and I think you shared some of the program areas, but just how do we get to a billion dollars this year? And we've also gotten a lot of questions about, can we go further than that? I think we can go further than that. I know that Communities United for Police Reform have been uh, putting together a document that outlines some of their uh, proposed and targeted uh, cuts that they think uh, would work. We're looking at that. We the council finance staff is looking at that. Um, the cuts that we've identified would be not be not hiring the next four uh, NYPD cadet classes, which would uh, have us not hiring about 2000 officers over the next year and allowing for significant uh, attrition to go through. So the loss of people from the job that would be what we think is more than 2000 people. So you would see a reduced headcount uh, of the NYPD of more than 2,000 uniformed officers. Uh, we're also looking for uh, savings in their OTPS budget, in their capital budget, uh, in moving school safety out, in moving their engagement in homelessness and people who are mentally ill out. Uh, all of those things, plus some of their contracting issues, some of their equipment, all of that would get us uh, over $1.1 billion in a cut. Though again, I'll just repeat that the administration uh, is not seemingly open to many of the things that we have proposed. And we are taking a look at what uh, Communities United for Police Reform has proposed as well. Uh, you've mentioned that the mayor has been an obstacle uh, I don't believe that this was a question that was submitted, but I'm sure it's a question people have. What can people do to put pressure on the mayor to be a better partner to you and the council in making this happen? I mean, I don't want to sound uh, sort of, uh, how do I say this? Like, uh, I'll just say that how could he not hear the message already? You know, the message is very, very clear. Um, people are still protesting. Uh, we're still seeing black people get murdered every single day across this country. The movement for this, um, this is a defining moment in American history. This is a reckoning. This is a moment to do something real and transformative. So I think people should uh, continue to reach out to him uh, and to his office uh, to continue to push him. Um, I believe the council will get there, uh, but I, you know, I'm I'm not confident that we're going to have a partner in this budget process that's going to want to meaningfully work with us on doing something transformative and structural. I see a number of hands going up. We're, we, we're working with these questions that have been already submitted. Uh, that being said, you can always email me, bkalos at uh, benkalos.com. You can also uh, hit me on social media at benkalos. Uh, Corey, what is the best way for folks to contact you if they have questions that we don't happen to get to tonight? Uh, speaker Johnson at council.nyc.gov. And uh, best way on social media? Uh, my, uh, my Twitter handle, uh, NYC Speaker Kojo. Amazing. Uh, now, we, we just spent a lot of time talking about uh, the budget, but uh, we also have legislative powers. 
Uh, you mentioned it a little bit in your opening. I, I was a co-sponsor of all of these bills. Can you talk a little bit about the legislative work you've done today uh, yeah. and uh, what else can be done legislatively? Yeah, I want to give the credit on this to the, to the members that were pushing it. Uh, again, predominantly the black members of the council, though some other members as well, like Councilman Rory Lanceman, uh, who authored the chokehold bill. Our chokehold bill that we passed today is stronger than the state chokehold bill that passed last week. The way our bill is stronger is the state bill uh, only bans chokeholds if there is a serious injury that takes place. Our bill does not require serious injury to take place. Our bill says that if you are uh, pushing on the diaphragm, the carotid artery, the, uh, the, the, the windpipe, uh, not just through the chokehold that killed Eric Garner, but the same type of uh, thing that killed George Floyd. Uh, or we saw Officer Garcia a few weeks ago on the Lower East Side who was sitting on that young man on the sidewalk uh, arresting him, those things would be uh, illegal under our bill that we passed today. So it goes farther than the state bill that passed last week. And our bill uh, creates it a, a misdemeanor against the cop who does that. So it's not just a violation. It's not just a, you know, a civil penalty. It is a criminal offense now in New York City. The state bill uh, does not go as far as the bill that we passed today in the city council. There are other bills that we passed. I'll just run through them very quickly. A bill that does not allow for officers to cover their badges. And if they do cover their badges, uh, New Yorkers could, uh, could sue them, uh, have a private right of action against them. Uh, before some of these things were outlawed in the patrol guide, which said you can't cover your badge. It was in the patrol guide. We saw that they were doing that anyway during the protests. So they were violating the patrol guide. This actually makes it a law. You would be violating the law and New Yorkers would have a legal right to sue based off of that. Same thing on filming the police. In the patrol guide, it says you're not allowed to interfere with a New Yorker filming you, but it wasn't in the law in New York City. It was in a guide. Now it will be under the law of New York City and it will allow people to bring a private right of action against uh, the PD if they try to interfere with someone filming them. Uh, we passed a bill today called the POST Act, which is going to require the NYP to disclose the technology that they use in New York City. Uh, any type of technology that they use, they are going to have to disclose that. And the Inspector General, which is outside of the NYPD, the NYPD Inspector General does not sit with inside the NYPD. It sits within another agency, the Department of Investigation. The inspector general would then have the ability to get access to that information, to write reports, to audit the, that information. That was another bill. Another bill would create a disciplinary matrix that Councilman Richards passed, which says that if you do something that is uh, against uh, guidelines or the law, here is the matrix of how you should be disciplined so that one cop doesn't get one type of discipline for one incident and another cop gets another type of discipline for the same type of incident, that there's more consistency across the board, which we know hasn't been the case over the years. Uh, and there's another bill on early intervention system, which would track uh, police officers that have been engaged in certain type of conduct that have used use of force. And there would be a system that actually tracks that to be able to flag uh, problematic officers with a history of doing these things in a real time way. That's a flavor of some of the bills. And again, I wanna say these bills are a step in the right direction, but these bills are not transformative bills. These bills are not the type of things that are going to change the NYPD, that is going to change public safety in New York City. What will change public safety in New York City is us taking a look at every aspect of what the police are involved in right now and saying why, how, does it need to be this way? For us to have a conversation like what's happening in Minneapolis and them looking at how to restructure their police department and come up with other ways to provide public safety to their citizens, we should be doing the same thing here. And that's why I think the budget process 
is a real opportunity to do something transformational in getting the police out of the schools, in getting the police out of homeless response, in getting the police out of dealing with emotionally disturbed individuals or individuals who are suffering from mental illness. That's why we have a lot of leverage in the budget and we're gonna use that leverage to get these things done in a meaningful way so that we don't have to wait six months or nine months or a year to start having these conversations. The conversations will have to continue. I do not believe that in the next two weeks we're gonna solve everything that has been wrong with policing in New York City over the last many years, many decades, many generations. I think this is the beginning of that conversation. This is the beginning of taking meaningful, real steps to do those things. But it is the beginning. It is nowhere near the middle. It is nowhere near the end. And my hope is that we can look to other places. We can look at Camden. We can look at Eugene, Oregon. We can look at Minneapolis. And we can look to see what things they've done that have that inform the decisions we make moving forward to do something transformative and real. What we need to be doing, and I said this at the stated meeting today, is we need to be investing in education. We need to be investing in uh, cure violence initiatives that do not involve law enforcement. We need to be investing in uh, mental health, in housing, in youth programming, and all the things that matter. And we are not gonna play a budget game with the mayor over the next two weeks where he agrees to slightly decrease and defund the NYPD funding a little bit more by giving us some more member items. We are not engaging in that game. We are not pitting children who get funding who are on the spectrum or seniors that get home delivered meals or youth that get uh, restorative justice programming. We are not pitting those things against a further uh, decrease in NYPD money. These things are not tied together. You need to defund the NYPD, divest from the NYPD while adding money to the things that I just mentioned, adding money to the things that we invest in every year. And the final thing I'll say on this, because I know I've been speaking for a while, if we can take more questions. The final thing I'll say is it didn't get much attention last year. The press didn't uh, write about it at all. But one of our big wins in the budget last year was we got 200 additional social workers for public schools across New York City. The mayor did not want to do it. They told us no the whole way along, and we fought until the end to get 200 social workers. 175 of those social workers have been hired since July of last year. 25 of them still need to be hired. Uh, the mayor did not include that funding in his executive budget, so he is literally proposing to cut the 200 social workers that we secured in last year's budget. And many of those social workers are to go to schools that have very high populations of homeless children in New York City that didn't have social workers. So those are some of the things that we are focused on fighting to see restored in this budget and actually added to in this budget. Corey, I want to Thank you for acknowledging the leadership of our council, of our black council members. And I, I want to agree with you for their leadership and their leadership is more important at this time than ever before. I, I do want to note that many of the bills that we passed today were introduced last term. And it is you and your role as the speaker who amplified the voices of our colleagues of color and our black members and brought these important bills to a vote today. Thank you, Ben. But I also want to say uh, that I was uh, wrong. And I think it's important to normalize saying when you're wrong in this moment in American history, when uh, we have to take responsibility uh, for uh, past mistakes. And uh, it was wrong that it, took to, that it took this long to pass the bills that we passed this day, today. It was wrong that uh, we uh, didn't look at the NYPD's budget in a more thorough manner over the years. And I'm not going to stand here today and make excuses because uh, that's not what a leader does. I think what a leader does is apologizes, works with others to actually act, see real change. And that's what I'm committed to doing. I'm committed to working with my black colleagues in the council, taking their lead to figure out where we are investing money where they feel comfortable cutting from the NYPD, where they want us to focus in the weeks and months ahead. 
And so, of course, I'm glad that we are doing this now, uh, but these are actions that should have happened years ago. And I will say, again, not as an excuse, but as a, a point of um, recognizing the uh, privilege that I have, as well as the being blinded by that privilege sometimes. I don't think I ever uh, contemplated or thought about thinking about public safety in this transformational way that we're thinking about right now. And I'm glad we're doing this now. And I'm glad, I'm glad we as a council are doing this now. And that's what this is about. This is about re-envisioning, re-imagining what public safety means in New York City. If we can do it in the largest city in the United States, just like we did, as you said earlier, on climate change. Two years ago, we passed the most forward-reaching climate change laws of any city in the entire world. And cities are now following us to do what we did on building emissions. If we can do that on policing in New York, if we can do that on public safety in New York, we can set a standard, we can set a model for other cities across the country and for other cities across the world. And my hope is that over the next 18 months of uh, my being speaker, regardless of what uh, happens after I'm here, if I'm elected to another office or not, I want these next 18 months to be about that, about doing something that we look back on and that we are proud of, that recognize this moment in history and took advantage of it to do something transformational and real. That's what I'm committed to. And I'm committed to doing that with uh, New Yorkers and especially uh, with our uh, black colleagues who um, are really leading in this moment and have very strong feelings about what we should be doing as a body, how we should be doing it and how it's being sequenced. We're gonna continue on the criminal justice theme. Uh, do you support those who protested uh, following the uh, murder of George Floyd, those protesting uh, for Black Lives Matter and against the curfew? And do you support dropping charges against those New Yorkers? Yes, I do support dropping charges. And I believe that the DAs have said that they're not gonna prosecute uh, those charges. I do support, of course, the protesters. I uh, went out and, and uh, marched in uh, three separate marches, uh, and I broke curfew in doing that with Council Members Levin and Reynoso in marching through Greenpoint and uh, Williamsburg on the early days of the protests. Uh, I think that, you know, anyone who wants to, anyone who's alive and, and says to themselves, you know, if I was alive in the uh, 1960s, I, I wish I could have participated in the uh, civil rights era or I was alive in the late 60s, early 70s. I wish I could have participated in the early movement for LGBT rights. Now is the moment to do that. That's what this moment calls for. And through direct action and civil disobedience, uh, through uh, continued protest. I mean, the, uh, our colleague, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo said today, which was uh, very moving, she said the Montgomery uh, bus boycott uh, lasted over 370 days. Uh, it wasn't a week or two weeks or three weeks. It was direct, consistent uh, civil disobedience. So I, of course, support that. Any social justice movement has seen those things to be unbelievably effective in creating meaningful change in a lasting way. And again, this is not, I believe, a conversation. Of course, uh, this is not me going back on what I said earlier. This is not only a conversation about the budget, of course it's about the budget, and we're focused on the budget, but I recognize this is a conversation that goes far beyond what happens before July 1st. It's, a, it's, it's going to be something that goes on for months and months and potentially years and potentially when I'm not in office anymore. And it's important for us to start it, to do some things that are meaningful and real uh, on the budget, on legislation, on oversight, on accountability, and I'm committed to doing that uh, with, uh, with my colleagues of color uh, over these next many months and until we leave the council. Continuing on the theme of uh, criminal justice, do you stand by your vote to construct four new jails for $11 billion that the city faces a major budget shortfall? And where are you at with the promise to close Rikers and uh, 
can, where, where are you with the promise to close Rikers? So let me just uh, provide some context here. Uh, you know, the, the capacity, I believe, of Rikers Island and the other jail facilities in New York City, I could get the number wrong, I apologize, I'm off a little bit, was I believe almost 14,000 uh, people um, could be incarcerated in facilities in New York City. The plan that we voted on uh, decreased that amount to less than 5,000. And part of my concern was that the proposal that we voted on was not a proposal that would have closed all of the facilities. So if we voted that down, Rikers still would have stayed open. And because of a broken criminal justice system, uh, people who would be sentenced. I, I opposed the, the rollbacks to bail reform that happened earlier this year. I spoke out against people trying to weaken our bail reform laws that were passed over a year ago. Uh, and my fear is that if we're still sending people away uh, and you close Rikers and you, you vote to uh, close Rikers Island and you vote to close the other jail facilities, if people are still being sentenced, they, they're going to be sent upstate. They're going to be sent to other places uh, where they can't be close to their family or their legal counsel. And many of those facilities are just as bad as Rikers Island. So I want to explain that that is the context for the vote that we took. It wasn't a perfect vote. It wasn't a vote that, again, solved many of these problems that we're talking about on systemic structural racism that exists in our criminal justice system. But you know, if, 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 people, for, if people are going to be sentenced uh, to incarceration, uh, you know, the facilities that exist right now are, are totally inhumane. Not that I think any jail is a humane situation, but on Rikers Island last summer, when the blackout was occurring, people were literally, you know, baking in their cells and the same thing in the Brooklyn House of Detention. Um, so, you know, I think there needs to be a movement to, for us to figure out how to, of course, deal with the over-incarceration and the rollback of the bail laws didn't help in that way because more people are now being sent to jail and prison than they were before the state legislature uh, rolled those back as part of the budget deal. Uh, but I want to provide context on, on, on my vote. Thank you. We are about 35 minutes in, uh, and I think we're going to transition away from criminal justice uh, and uh, a lot of what we've been working on in terms of NYPD reform, and uh, we'll start going into some speed round. Uh, what are you doing to alleviate the economic strain of rent on many low-income New Yorkers who've lost their jobs? When the rent freeze lifts, how will we prevent a mass eviction from taking place throughout our city? It's one of the biggest things that I'm concerned about. The eviction moratorium ends uh, in, I believe, August. I think it's in August is when it ends, though it may be extended. And one of the difficulties that we have right now is that the city is facing a $10 billion budget hole in our budget, which is why you saw those uh, unacceptable proposed cuts by the mayor in education and youth programming and many of the things that we care about and we fought for over the years. The state is facing a $13 billion budget hole. So that's $23 billion between the two of us. And it looks like that in the next few weeks, the state could potentially cut our budget by another $2 billion on top of what we have right now which would make us $2 billion more in the hole. So how does that relate to the issue around rent? If we could on our own create a voucher program, we'll create a program that would give rental assistance vouchers for New Yorkers that have been affected by COVID-19, by the economic shutdown, we would do that. The state legislature a month ago passed a bill in Albany, which said that if we get the fourth stimulus bill, the HEROES Act, that part of the state and locality money that is proposed in that, bill, in that bill that passed the House, that would go towards this type of program that I'm talking about, a rental assistance voucher program that impacted tenants could use to pay their rent. 
Uh, I'm not remembering at this moment how they're defining income restrictions. I apologize, just not remembering. But the state passed that bill. The HEROES Act, which passed the House, proposed giving New York City $12 billion in the upcoming, uh, in the upcoming bill in this upcoming year and $4 billion in the next year. I'm not remembering the amount of money for the state, but it was an even bigger number than $12 billion for the city. And so the state legislature passed a bill that said if and when they get that money, they will devote that money to a program like the one we're talking about that would give New Yorkers affected by COVID-19 rental assistance vouchers to pay their rent for a certain period of time. So because we have a $10 billion hold, which could grow to $12 billion in just the next few weeks, that's what makes it difficult for the city council and for the mayor uh, to be able to enact a program like this. And it's why we're relying on these federal funds. You heard Mitch McConnell say seven or eight weeks ago, let the blue states and cities go bankrupt, which is a totally immoral uh, thing to say because it will mean uh, devastation for so many working class people, for children, for seniors, for public housing residents, for the undocumented, uh, for everyone who is most vulnerable right now. And it's why, I'll just highlight, it's why you know, we really need them to vote on this bill. We're not getting that money before the July 1st city budget deadline. They said they're not thinking about voting on the House bill until uh, July or August, the end of July or the beginning of August, which means we won't see that money for a while, if at all. And I assume that the Senate will weaken that bill, will, uh, you know, will cut the amount of money that I just mentioned uh, in half or by 75%, which again, is not going to be helpful for us. I support raising taxes on millionaires and billionaires in New York City to create more revenue. I support a stock transfer tax. I support other progressive tax measures that the city council has no authority on. It's up to the state legislature. The only local taxing authority we have is on property taxes. Uh, and even that we need authorization from the state legislature. But those are some other ways that we could raise revenue right now outside of the federal stimulus money. We have a question from a NYCHA resident who says that it is despicable as a civilized society that people live in housing with elevators, plumbing, and electricity in disrepair that has still not been taken care of properly. How do we get housing up to standards immediately? Well, immediately, I'm not sure it's possible to do it immediately, like tomorrow or next week or even in the next few months. And, and whoever the resident is that wrote in, they are right. It is totally unacceptable. NYCHA has an outstanding capital need associated with it of more than $40 billion, $40 billion. And uh, it's why we need an infrastructure bill from the Congress that when we talk about infrastructure, we're not just talking about tunnels and bridges and roads and mass transit. We also need to make sure that public housing is part of that infrastructure bill. Uh, the need for public housing across the country is hundreds of billions of dollars in outstanding capital need. And my hope is, is that uh, in this next stimulus bill or even beyond that, uh, if we take back the Senate, that we can actually get a meaningful infrastructure bill that funds public housing. Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez has a bill that would uh, pay, an appropriation bill that would pay for the outstanding capital need for public housing in New York City by making it part of the larger infrastructure package that people have been talking about over the years. Of course, the US Senate has not moved that. Uh, this past year, the state put in zero money into public housing, not a single dollar into public housing. Uh, and so we need to keep fighting for money from the state, for money from the feds. Public housing is under a consent decree right now. Uh, it's basically in some form of receivership where Ben Carson, the secretary of HUD, appointed a receiver to oversee HUD and its management practices. 
but this has been, uh, sorry, oversee NYCHA, not HUD, oversee NYCHA and its management practices, but it is an unacceptable situation that has gone on for a very long time. And the only real way out of it is through a massive infusion of both capital dollars to fix the buildings, the lead paint, the elevators, uh, the vermin infestations, uh, all of the things that we know are a systemic and endemic problem. And then you have to couple that with operating dollars where you have the appropriate staff, maintenance staff uh, and others to be able to do the type of maintenance on a regular basis. Every year, the public advocate of New York City puts out a worst landlords list. And the worst landlord in New York City is NYCHA. They are the worst landlord. And it's because of the abominable conditions that NYCHA residents have to live in. We're gonna, we've got about 15 minutes left and we're gonna transition over to uh, schools uh, and, and mainly a lot of questions relating to coronavirus. Uh, do, does the council have any additional information beyond what DOE has put out? Um, the timeline for schools reopening in person, uh, will they remain open? Uh, what is the, the DOE's plan for uh, a post-pandemic uh, school? That's a good question, and I, I don't say this in a, in a flippant way. I don't have the answer to it. You know, I've done these type of Zoom town halls with every PTA for every elementary school in my council district. And what I hear is most maddening to parents is the lack of communication and plans from the Department of Education. I don't say this in a way of us evading responsibility or shirking responsibility as a city council, but the council has no legislative authority over the DOE. Uh, because of mayoral control, the mayor and the chancellor, coupled with the PEP, the Panel for Educational Policy, have all of the decision-making authority. So we have been asking the questions. We have been grilling them. Our colleague, Councilmember Mark Traeger, the chair of our education committee, has been talking about these issues every single day. We will stay on it. My personal uh, feeling and opinion on schools, I think, it's, uh, I think it was the right decision to close them at the height of the pandemic. I understand why we haven't been able to reopen them before the end of the school year. The to close them because he wouldn't close them. He wouldn't close them, that's right. Uh, and I think that, um, but I think it's incredibly sad and devastating that so many children have been disconnected from their friends and from their teachers and from their school communities since the second week of March. And when you think about children who are special uh, needs, when you think about children who may be on the spectrum, when you think about children who have a, a, an IEP, an individualized educational plan, when you think about uh, disabled children or children with mobility impairments, and you think about how hard this has been on them, I think we need a plan to reopen the schools in a safe way, a plan that uh, allows for social distancing, a writ large plan for every for the entire system, but individualized for every single school, depending on the size of the building, depending on the capacity, depending on what the cafeteria looks like, depending on the outdoor space that they have. That's what we need from the DOE. And parents need to plan. Parents need to be, be able to understand what's going to happen this September and how they're planning for it, not just with their families, but they want to make sure their kids are safe. The, the number of children that have died from COVID-19 is extraordinarily low uh, across the world. Um, and I think it's important that we are guided by public health professionals, but we need to look at the facts. We need to look at the science and we have to understand how we can safely reopen our schools. Next, it relates to uh, social distancing and, and wearing masks. Uh, and so the, the, the one question is, are the police required to wear masks or not? Yes, they are. They're required. I asked about this at the hearing and it's, it's appalling and unacceptable that they're not wearing masks. We need everyone to wear masks and they're not above the law. They need to wear a mask. 
And if they're not wearing a mask, they should be disciplined for it because they are putting the public at risk. If we're telling protesters to wear masks, if we're telling people in grocery stores to wear masks, if we're telling subway conductors to wear masks, if we're telling grocery store workers to wear masks, the police need to be wearing masks. It's, it's, not, it's not complicated. As people are asked to return to work, uh, where there will be social distancing on the MTA, what efforts are being planned to keep us safe on public transportation, uh, how will we increase buses and subway consistence, consistently running so people are actually spaced out? Look, we've had a lack of proactive planning from the de Blasio administration on item after item after item. The council are the ones we are the ones that called for the open streets plan to allow for open streets across New York City when the mayor said he wanted police to actually police open streets and we said no. We're the ones that pushed on having outdoor dining for restaurants, which is starting on Monday, and they didn't come up with a fulsome plan for that. We are the ones that have been pushing on the DOE. We are the ones that have been pushing on transportation. So let me tell you this. We don't run the MTA. Uh, the MTA is state run, uh, but the city does have some voice. The mayor does have some voice because the mayor has appointments to the MTA board, some of whom were just confirmed to the MTA board last week by the New York State Senate. Uh, my personal opinion is that we need to increase bus service significantly to be able to alleviate crowding on buses and have less people take the subway who could then switch to buses. The bike lanes that have been set up have been totally inadequate compared to what other cities around the world have done. Look at Paris, look at London, look at other cities that have been able to adapt really quickly. Uh, we need to make sure that we are increasing subway service so that people are not uh, crowded into a subway or crowded into a platform. Some of that means operationalizing changes in looking at capacity. Some of it's going to require employers uh, staggering the schedules of people not being and not having to come in all at the same time, which is what was called for at the beginning of this pandemic when actually we should have been fully shut down at that moment and not had anyone riding the subways. Uh, but that was called for at the time. These are some of the things that we need to do. Increase bus lanes, increase bus service, create safer places for pedestrians and cyclists increase subway service to so have more frequent subway service, operationalize how you handle capacity, be handing out masks at every single subway station, regardless of what part of the city that it's in, have regular cleaning, staggering schedules. These are all the things that we need to do. And this should be a proactive plan that even though the mayor doesn't control the subways, we do control the streets of New York City that the buses run on. We do control a bunch of things that could actually impact this, like bike lanes, like bus lanes, like further pedestrianization, like open streets. These are things that we should be doing to give people confidence and to create uh, public health safety as it relates to COVID-19 as we start to come out of this. Uh, we, we are approaching the end of our hour with Speaker Johnson. I, I have one question before I'll ask for a quick concluding remarks, which is, What's the plan for this summer for our young kids, for pools, for parks, for our seniors, for cooling? Uh, what does this summer look like as we continue to move slowly and uh, quite cautiously? And that's, that is a good thing through the phases of opening. Again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I just want to say these are things that the administration should have planned months ago. Uh, you know, initially it was said that pools would not open during this summer. And then in the last few days, the mayor said, maybe we can open public pools. Well, the, the head of the lifeguard union uh, said, we can't now. We didn't do the right planning. We didn't do the right recruitment. We didn't actually plan it in a way that would allow pools to be open. So what does that mean? My big fear is when school is over and children are not doing remote learning, and I could talk about a many, many problems on remote learning, on distance learning, 
uh, that we've seen. You need something that are going that's going to um, keep children engaged and active, emotionally engaged and stimulated in a meaningful way. And that is why the zeroing out of 135,000 youth slots for summer youth employment, for the Beacon program, for the Cornerstone program, for the Sonic program, for the summer camp slots. Excuse me. If we don't have those slots, it's a disaster. So that's why the council is going to push to restore those slots. Young people need to be engaged. They need something to do. They need activities. They need social and emotional learning. They need an income. A bunch of these programs actually provide them a stipend, provide them income. A lot of the families use that income for uh, clothes, for back to school, for school supplies. Uh, we realize how important this is. And that's why we're fighting to restore that youth funding uh, in this upcoming budget. And it's why we need a plan for beaches. I put out a plan with all of the colleagues in the council who represent beaches on what we think beach reopenings in a real way should look like. It's why we should have had a plan for pools. It's why we need a plan for open streets uh, during the course of the summer where you could open up fire hydrants uh, for cooling. These are some of the things that we need to do collectively, not singularly, collectively. Got a couple more moments, so just want to uh, close out. I want to thank you, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, for joining us, our district. Uh, we've had over 200 people at various times uh, tuning in over different uh, platforms. You can watch on Facebook, uh, Twitter. We will also be posting on YouTube. You heard it here, a commitment to defund NYPD, a path to cut a billion dollars from NYPD this year to invest in communities harmed by over-policing, a plan for how to reopen, and so much more. And so I just want to thank Corey Johnson. I think he's been an amazing speaker and when it comes to getting real things done or actually just being what we need more in politics, which is folks who are actually just willing to say they're sorry when they make a mistake. I know I'm willing to say I'm sorry when I make mistakes. Don't tell my wife I'm not perfect, uh, but uh, just so glad to have you. And so everyone to participate. I wanna thank the more than 140,000 people who have emailed to defund the NYPD. Please keep it up. Please email the mayor, please tweet the mayor, please hit him on every part of social media. He needs to hear your, hear your voice. And uh, Corey's been with you on the streets. I've been with you on the streets and we will continue to push for it. Uh, Speaker Johnson, if you can uh, please close us out. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and we look forward to uh, really fighting hard for budget justice over the next uh, two weeks on uh, divesting from the NYPD and investing in communities on uh, ensuring that we are funding and uh, social programs, human services, education, youth programs, mental health, all the things that we know are important, saving those social workers that are on the chopping block. Uh, saving uh, many of the programs that we fought for for years. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you all and with my colleagues in the council. So everyone, please stay safe, uh, stay healthy. We still have a pandemic that's going on. We want people to still wear a mask, uh, wash their hands, socially distance, and look out for one another. So I wanna thank you, Ben, for hosting this tonight. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you all very, very much. Have a safe night. Thank you to Speaker Corey Johnson. If you enjoyed this, we do this all the time. We do Bend in Your Building, we do First Friday, and we are here at your disposal. We work for you. This government belongs to you. Have a good night.